Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's educational webinar with Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. I'm Kathy Riley, the Associate Director of Programs at CSCLA, and I'm honored to welcome you to this week's webinar titled Lung Cancer Screening and Lung Health. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles is a premier nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you would like to learn more about our services or watch past webinars, please visit our website at cancersupportla.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, please note that your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar. You may, however, enter your questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but our presenter will share her contact information at the end of the webinar. I'd like to introduce our speaker now. Sarah Belton is the nurse navigator for Providence St. John's Lung Screening Program at the Cardiothoracic Outpatient Clinic. She completed her nursing education in Canada and received her PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where her research focused on pediatric HIV AIDS service provision and access in Uganda. Sarah has worked in clinical health services, global health research, government policy and planning, health administration, and academia. A world traveler at heart, she enjoys learning about new cultures and experiencing new places. When not working at Providence, Sarah can be found relaxing at the beach or exploring the cultural offerings of Santa Monica and the greater Los Angeles area. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Belton. Uh, Sarah, um, go ahead and turn your camera on and welcome to uh, welcome to the webinar. And please feel free to share your slides when you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. It's really nice to be joining everyone this afternoon. Thanks for the lovely uh, introduction and uh, welcome everyone to the presentation. So as Kathy had said, um, I have some slides prepared. We'll go through them. Hopefully we'll answer a lot of your questions, give you some good food for thought. And then after that, if you have questions, we'll take them at the end. Um, and if you do have additional questions, uh, my contact information will be there. If you have further questions, I'm, I'm more than happy for you to get in touch with me. Okay, so I just start on here. And can everybody see the slide okay? Hopefully we can. Sarah, we are not seeing the oh, slide. Sorry, okay. Sorry, let me just go back here so that I may have to reset this. I'm just gonna redo it one more time here. Sorry about that. Okay. And then I'll just swap over. Sorry about that. Just give me one second. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> We can see them perfectly, thank you. Oh, great, thanks, sorry for that. <laughs> Borrowing an office so that we have a nice quiet uh, place to, to chat here. So, uh, so this is the presentation, lung cancer, lung screening and lung health. And uh, just to give you a quick outline, uh, there's three main areas that we'll talk about today. I'm gonna give you a very brief overview on lung cancer, some information about it and determining your risks for lung cancer. After that, I'll talk about lung cancer screening, what the process is. I'll tell you a little bit about our program and also a bit more about smoking cessation and additional cancer prevention resources and some, some ideas for preventing cancer, not just lung cancer, but all types of cancer. After that, we'll talk about lung health. We'll talk about the importance of lung care. I'll give you some tips to keep your lungs as healthy as possible. And we'll also talk a little bit about some of the treatment options, some of the new advances in treatment uh, directions for the future. And uh, after that, we'll have time for questions and answers. So to give you a brief overview then of lung cancer, and I'll talk a little bit about cancer in general as well. First thing I do want to say is cancer really isn't a death sentence, and we need to stop thinking about cancer as being a, a death sentence straight off of the bat. 
2019, which were the most recent statistics um, from before the pandemic, there were almost 17 million cancer survivors in the United States alone. And by 2030, this number is predicted to grow to over 22 million survivors, which is really an incredible number. The majority of these survivors, about two thirds, were actually diagnosed five or more years ago, which is a fantastic uh, length of length span of quality of life and quantity of life post cancer diagnosis. And almost 20% were diagnosed 20 or more years ago. So that's really incredible numbers. We've seen incredible work over the past couple of decades in cancer survivorship. And in the state of California, we have almost 1.9 million cancer survivors. So almost 2 million people in the state of California alone are cancer survivors. So I think that's something we should really celebrate. However, for lung cancer, the survival rates, unfortunately, are much lower than that for other cancers. And what we know currently is that only one in five lung cancer patients are actually found at stage one, which is the earliest stage uh, you can find cancer at. And unfortunately, the main reason is because the physical signs and symptoms of lung cancer only really develop at a much later stage. So early detection and treatment is really the key for us and for my work in trying to help improve lung cancer survivorship. So just briefly, I know many of you will be very familiar with cancer, but just a very quick review. Uh, cancer to me, I, I call it cells gone wild, you know. And so what happens is when our cells in our body, it can be any, any type of cell, when they are damaged, they often start to grow abnormally and they start to get a little bit misshapen. I'll show you a picture of uh, an electromicroscope an electromicroscope photograph of uh, some cancer cells here in a moment. Um, and you'll start to see how they do grow abnormally. They get very misshapen, they get uh, a little spiky. And as they start to change in this way from their nice, normal, round or oblong, plump quality to this spiky, almost angry looking type of cell, they may also start to clump together with other cells and influence them to, to, damage, uh, to be damaged and to to clump together then. Uh, these clumps are actually then termed nodules, uh, if they're in particular, if they're in the lungs. Now nodules themselves can be either benign or malignant, benign being that it's, it's the type of nodule that will not cause cancer. Malignant, of course, meaning that it is cancerous. So when we're looking in terms of lung and lung cancer, the CT scans are really the gold standard to be used uh, to check your lungs for nodules and to determine their size, shape, those are the things we look at when we're looking at a CT scan, the results, the pictures that come back from the machine. And those pictures can help us to determine if a nodule needs to be further investigated for cancer. So I'll show you a picture here just now. So again, this is if we zoomed into two individual cancer cells, this is what you might see under an electron microscope. You can see they look a little angry, they look spiky, they kind of look maybe a little bit punky you know, really uh, very angry looking cells. And normal cells in your body are typically more round or oblong, they're plump, they're full of fluid, they're, they're very sort of soft and squishy if you were to reach out and touch them. And when you look at cancer cells, they get very spiky, they often kind of shrink a little bit, they get misshapen like that, very angular. I, to me, they really look like angry cells. And, and the process of cancer really is cells gone wild. They go through these mutations, these changes, they proliferate, and that's then what causes a tumor, or when we're looking at the lungs specifically, we call those nodules. So what are some of the causes of lung damage and cancer? And lung cells, again, they, they are damaged by breathing in harmful substances over a long period of time. That's the main way that people do develop lung cancer is through the inhalation exposure. So the damage can be caused by chemicals, um, radon gas is, present in many parts of the United States and around the world. It's a naturally occurring radioactive gas that comes out of the geology, out of the, the types of rocks that you have. Um, that would be, for example, next to your basement, that sort of thing. We talk about radon a little bit later if you have questions. That is something that you can check for and that is often, depending on where you live, that may be something you want to look into. Uh, other chemicals, industrial chemicals, if you're working in industrial type settings, environmental pollution also, and the chemicals that come from that. Biological um, causes can be bacterial or viral infections, inflammation related damage, environmental exposure, and uh, substances like mold, fungus, and spores. They can cause lung damage. They may not necessarily cause cancer, the biologics. Radiation um, is a particular concern, radiation exposure, and 
that does actually include radiation for other cancers, such as breast cancer. That can be a risk factor, and that would be something you'd want to consider. And if you, I can speak more about that if you have questions, that if you have had breast cancer and if you had had radiation therapy for that, that might be something you want to have a conversation with, with your oncologist or with your physician about if, if you should be considering having perhaps a, a lung cancer screening exam with the CT. And uh, we can talk more about that in detail if you have any questions at the end. But the main cause for, for lung damage and lung cancer in particular is really smoking tobacco products. That's the statistics show that up to 90% of people who develop lung cancer are current or former smokers. The reason being is that there are over 7,000 different chemicals in cigarette smoke, and we know that 70 of them cause cancer. There may be more that cause cancer, we just don't have the data at this point to, to link them to cancer. But secondhand smoke exposure can also be an impact. So if you've been around someone who smokes or if you, you know, worked in workplaces, you know, for example, bars, restaurants, other settings where we used to have much more smoking before the tobacco legislation in the 1990s that pushed smoking outside of enclosed areas. You know, secondhand exposure um, in the United States, it causes over 7,300 lung cancer deaths per year in people who didn't smoke but were exposed and had a long-term exposure to cigarette smoke secondhand. So those are the main causes for lung damage and uh, lung cancer in particular. In terms of people's risk for lung cancer, it is actually the leading cause of death from cancer in the United States. Uh, you actually have at this point one in 14 people in the United States who will develop lung cancer. And a lot of that is due to that smoking exposure and smoking history from before the legislation that, that pushed tobacco outside of enclosed spaces and buildings. Uh, at this current moment, 25% of all cancer deaths are actually from lung cancer, and it is actually the leading cause of death now for cancer from women. We've had great strides in getting the message out about lots of other preventative tests and the mammograms for breast cancer. Lung cancer has been a little bit behind in that regard. So that is an area where we're hoping with some newer guidelines that we'll talk about in a little bit um, that hopefully that will increase people's um, opportunity to have a lung screening CT done. So to sum up, you may be at risk for lung cancer if you did smoke uh, or currently smoke tobacco products on a regular basis. If you were exposed to tobacco smoke or harmful chemical substances, either at work or at home. And also if you do have a significant family history of lung cancer, we know that there is a genetic component. It's not 100% certain, but it is something that we would want to consider. And if you were to call me up and, and have a conversation with me. That's something we can talk through and, and a lung screening program and a nurse navigator should, should have that conversation with you if there is family risk for cancer and in particular lung cancer as well. So my message really is don't wait until you're sick, please screen before. You know, if, if you participate in a lung screening program, again, we can, uh, as nurse navigator, I can help you determine your risk. We can talk about your history, about your exposures and, and get a good idea of of what that looks like for you individually. Um, and if you do go through a screening program and have the CT scan, it can detect lung cancer earlier before physical symptoms occur. So as a brief review, the physical symptoms of lung cancer, you'd have a persistent cough or, or constant trouble breathing. You'd be coughing up blood. You might have some unexplained chest pain or tightness. And if you've had it looked at by a, a GP or gone to the emergency room, you know, had an EKG done and nothing is showing up cardiac wise, it might be something to do with your lungs instead. It could even be lung cancer. Um, if you've had unusual loss of appetite or weight, and if you've had sort of a general malaise where you have lack of energy, you're feeling tired, weak, and it's not usual, or there's not been any reason that you can find as to why that would be a concern. I would definitely go to see your, your family physician and start having the conversation about maybe it's something else going on. The problem with lung cancer is all of these symptoms do show up at a later stage, and it's usually stage three or stage four where it shows up. And as I'll show you in this next slide here, that is fairly late in the game, and it often can lead to not as good outcomes when we find lung cancer later on at stage three or stage four. And this one slide next um, really sums it up for me. So this is a slide um, from uh, just before the pandemic, um, looking at the non-small cell lung cancer, the five-year survival rates. So, so if you're familiar with cancer, when we talk about 
survival. We are looking at how people do five years after diagnosis or treatment. That's what we're most interested in um, at, the, at the start to see how everyone's doing five years down the road, if they're okay, if they're ill, if they've had another cancer or if they've passed away, unfortunately. That's what we're interested in. And so as you can see here, very simply, it illustrates so, so clearly that the earlier that we can find and intervene for lung cancer in particular, and really all cancers in general, the better. If we can get to someone uh, and intervene at stage one or stage two, they have a much higher survival rate five years after diagnosis and treatment than if it's stage three or stage four. And again, thinking back to those symptoms that really only show up quite late in the game, stage three or stage four, the outcomes are really not as good. So it really is more important to look at your own personal history, your personal risk factors, and see if you, you would be benefiting from screening earlier on. And it just shows so clearly the drop off and, and I can speak from clinical experience as well. We've had a few patients we've been able to intervene at stage one. We can actually declare them even cancer free. We've been able to remove the, the nodules that were turning cancerous. They've done really well, haven't needed chemotherapy or radiation. And it's a really wonderful thing we can do that. We really do give them back their lives. And that really is important. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a family member for cancer survivors myself. So I, I know about the challenges and that is a wonderful thing that I can do in this job. So, so again, it stresses the importance of early screening and early detection. So moving on then to what that looks like in terms of lung cancer screening. So to review very quickly, uh, who's at the highest risk for lung cancer? Uh, so uh, early last year, they had some changes in the federal guidelines, um, which were aligned between uh, US Preventative Services uh, Task Force, the USPSTF and Medicare. Those are two of the big organizations that are doing research into uh, healthcare and prevention and recommendations for, for procedures and for screening and all of that. And they changed the criteria to actually make it a bit more inclusive. So uh, when we're looking for people who might be at highest risk for lung cancer, what we, the people we typically focus on are those who are aged 50 to 77. They're either a current smoker or they've quit smoking within the past 15 years. And they have a smoking history of 20 or more pack years. And you count pack years based on how much of a pack of cigarettes you smoke per day and how many years you've smoked for. So as my example there, if you smoked a pack a day in cigarettes and you smoked for 20 years, that's your 20 pack years. If you were a two pack a day smoker and you've smoked for 10 years, that comes out two times 10 to 20 years as well. So we do that calculation just to, because when they've looked at the data and they looked at large uh, studies, they found that people who meet those three criteria tend to be at the highest risk for developing lung cancer. And they have also found that um, when you're looking at currently smoking or quitting smoking, it seems to be that the, past, the, the 15 years, the first 15 years after you quit do put you at a bit higher risk for developing those, those angry cells, those cells gone wild that then can lead to lung cancer. So when you, if you gave me a call and wanted to have a conversation about should you be screened, those are the sorts of things I'd go through. I'd also add in some of your, your other medical history, your family history, bit of an environmental and risk and, and work history as well. And I'd look at all of those factors and helping to determine if, if you'd be a good candidate for lung cancer screening or not. And so with our program, then what it really is, is it's basically giving you a checkup of your lungs uh, for people who, who are at higher risk for cancer. It typically involves a CT scan that's considered the gold standard, gives us really good pictures of your lungs. Uh, that we can take a look at and look for any of those nodules or those, those cells gone wild. And uh, we come, you come in and have a CT scan with us and we'll go through it and we'll discuss the findings and if there's anything that we need to be concerned about. In many cases, um, just the same as with the mammograms for the ladies, um, when, when you come in and have a CT scan, it's often a yearly update. We'll want to keep an eye on your lungs longer term. So we'll have another CT scan in a year. And once a year is, is often the recommended uh, sequencing for having CT scans and follow-ups. So again, um, that's the sort of thing that I would help coordinate. Um, we'd have conversations about what that means for you in your life. Uh, I can help explain the findings, go through them with you. Um, if you are a current smoker, um, we are also uh, looking at uh, developing a smoking cessation class. We're hoping to run one in June, so I'll have more information on that later. In the meantime, there's other resources I can help direct you to, both from the LA County and the area, other groups that help with smoking cessation. 
After we do all of that, uh, I always get in touch with your primary care physician, let them know the results. And if they have any questions, we can follow up with them. We're really great in that we now have two wonderful thoracic surgeons who do um, chest surgeries and also are happy to help us in the lung screening program. We have uh, Dr. Robert McKenna, who's quite well known here in Southern California. He's been in the business for many years. We also just had uh, Dr. Baya Krishnadasan move down from Seattle. He was up at, uh, I think it was Swedish in uh, Seattle for quite a while. And he's moved down here now to work with Dr. McKenna. They actually know each other from many years ago, which is fantastic. And they're both wonderful surgeons, really top notch, great eyes for the CT scan and wonderful bedside manners and excellent surgeons as well. So if we do need to look at more involved interventions such as a biopsy or surgery, we would be connected with them and they would help uh, guide you through the process. And then if you do need additional, if we do find something on the scan that needs, for example, cancer surgery, uh, and if you did need other follow-ups such as radiotherapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapies, uh, Providence here, we are happy to connect you up with that and we all work together to try and provide the best cancer care we can to our patients. So all of that is available kind of as a one-stop shop. That's how we've really designed this program to make it easy to access and easy to link to other areas of care as you need it. So again, how it would work, you can give me a call. My phone number will be at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, see if you have questions, if you qualify, I'll go through eligibility. I'll try and answer some of questions that I can. Um, I always do try and check with the insurance and get approvals before we bring you in. I don't want anybody to have surprise bills as as was said in the introduction, I am originally from Canada, and I know that insurance is often a big concern for people with cancer in particular. So I always uh, make sure that everything is, is sorted out and everything's been approved before you come in and see us. So there's no worries or costs at the end of it. That's our surprise. Um, we set up a clinic appointment in the CT scan. We do them both at the same time. So you come in, have the CT scan, then come over next door to us. So we're just down the, down the hall from the CT department. And uh, we can look at your scans right away as they come up in the system and give you an answer right there in-house. And it's nice to be able to get an answer same day. That's, that's really a big strength of our program. Um, I review everything with you, answer any questions you might have while you're here with the visit. Uh, we still do send the CT out to radiology. We think it's always great to have a second check. So the radiologist will still review it after we've gone through it with you and give us the report. The report comes in to me. I then connect up with you, talk you through it. And if there's any discrepancies, we have a discussion between that and our physician, often radiology. Uh, they're all really good at reading CTs. I've, I've never seen it so far. I've been doing this for about a year and a half now, and I've not seen any discrepancies that are between the, the radiologist's read of the CT scans and our thoracic surgeon's read of it. it. They are all kind of singing from the same songbook when it comes to reading CTs. We all know what we're looking for. It's the same things. And uh, the great thing is then after that, I get back in touch with the primary care physician, update them. If they have any questions, I can handle that and uh, arrange following up care. You can come back then and see us next year if everything looks good and everything looks stable. And uh, we're happy to continue the service with you and coordinate care as needed. So it's simple, one-stop shop, and we try and make the process as easy as possible for people. So I'll show you a couple of pictures here to give you an example of what all of us are looking for on your CT scan. So the picture on the left-hand side is something that some, is often referred to as a ground glass opacity or a ground glass nodule. As you can see, the middle of it is kind of bright and on the bottom left-hand part of the scan there, it's kind of bright and then it kind of fades out. It almost maybe looks like a cotton ball or if you stretched out a piece of cotton candy at the fair. Um, that's a nodule we want to keep an eye on, but it's not as serious a finding as the next one here. That would be the sort of nodule where we'd say, um, we're often good to see you in a year for regular follow-up. We'll keep an eye on it. Sometimes the ground glass opacities can develop from inflammation. So that's why it's good to always come back and get another scan in a year and check and see if anything's changed. And sometimes they do often shrink as part of an inflammatory process. If they don't, or if they've changed shape in particular ways, then we want to look at perhaps having a scan more frequently or even looking at doing something of an intervention. The one in the middle, picture number two there, that is definitely one we'd want to do an intervention for. That is actually um, a nodule that has a potential to be malignant. So if we had a finding like that, and if you think it, the shape itself, even if you think back to the early slide where I had the couple of cancer cells gone wild, where they look all angry and misshapen and spiky, 
as you can see, the, the tumor in this case, uh, the, the nodule that's, that's potentially tumorous in this case also looks the same. So it's kind of a nice visual, visual there to see. Um, that would be one where we definitely would be having a conversation with you about biopsy and surgery. And I'll discuss some of the options for surgery um, in a few minutes here at the end of the presentation. That is definitely what we'd be looking for in terms of that be worrying finding. We'd be having some bigger conversations with you about what our next steps will be, what we would recommend for that, and, and we'd help you through all of that. And it's a little tough to see, but on the right-hand picture that's zoomed in quite closely, that's actually a benign finding. It's it, called a hamartoma. It's the one where it kind of looks like a piece of popcorn that's been popped you know, with the bright center and then the grayish area around it right in the middle of the screen on the right hand side. So that's actually a benign finding. And that would be one that we wouldn't need to worry about. It's, it's actually a type of almost like a little fat tumor, believe it or not, you can actually get them. And it, fat, fat nodule, I should say, not tumor. Uh, it's non-cancerous, it's benign. This is zoomed in quite closely. So if depending on the size, it might be something that we want to remove if it's causing you some breathing difficulties. If it's not causing you any difficulties, they typically don't change in size or shape once they develop. They kind of just stay the way that they are. People can, can have those in their lungs and it's if it doesn't cause them any difficulties in breathing or anything like that, they may just elect to not have a surgery, not have it removed. So as you can see, there's lots of different findings on the CT scan. And our physicians are really great in terms of their training. They know what they're looking for. They, they do this daily and they have really fantastic backgrounds and are able to spot things right away. And so those are the types of findings that we'd be looking for. That's why it's important to have the CT scan. It gives us really good visualization and lets us have a really good look at what's going on inside your lungs. And that's the most important thing in terms of maintenance year on year. So moving now to lung health. So what can I do to lessen my cancer risk? Well, the biggest thing is if you are currently smoking, if you can quit, that's where we really, really encourage you. It's, it, smoking is one of the biggest risks and quitting smoking can really help in terms of decreasing your risk and improving your lung functioning and your breathing on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Uh, so we have some options for helping you quit smoking. I am working with a few patients who are in the middle of their quitting journey. It's often a long journey, but it's one that's worth taking. We can help you get connected up to smoking cessation programs. There are some community programs, both in-person and uh, virtual offerings as well. Um, some people may find that over-the-counter smoking cessation aids, such as the, the gum or the lozenges or the patches help. Some may need something a bit more. And for those, uh, you need a prescription, but we're happy to give you and arrange prescriptions for that. Um, and there are options that include a uh, nicotine inhaler. Um, there's often a spray that you can get uh, depending on its availability here in the US. They've had some, they had some shortages during the pandemic, but they should be back to normal for that. And then also the more traditional prescription pills, uh, Wellbutrin and Chantrix are the two that are most commonly recognized. Wellbutrin um, has been around for a number of years and Chantrix is a newer one. So they work, they work in two different ways. So you have two different options there as well. I'm also happy to announce that in June, we will be doing a four week smoking cessation program. So I've got the link there. Uh, we start June 6th, uh, it's 5.30 uh, in the evenings on Tuesdays, uh, running four weeks in June. And uh, I'll be sending more information as well to CSCLA, but uh, you can also take a look at the link there uh, and take a look and register. It's a little bit of a course description on our website and we'd be happy to have you join us. That will be at Providence St. John's in Santa Monica can be done either in-house or virtual. So if that is something that would interest you, you're also welcome to get in touch with me and I can tell you a bit more about the program. It'll be run by me and it'll be over the four weeks consecutive. And then of course, our lung screening program, an annual clinic visit and CT scan to check your lungs. If, if you are definitely eligible, then that would be something I would absolutely recommend. It never hurts to take a look. So in terms of also lessening your lung cancer risk, you know, limiting the risks and the exposures to the inhaled hazards can also help a lot. Uh, as I said, uh, there will be a link at the end of the presentation to uh, a map for radon. Uh, there are some hot spots in the Los Angeles County area, so it might be worth taking a look uh, to see if, if you might be in an area that where you might want to look at if this is something you want to examine. Uh, what we usually recommend, the first step is to get one of the uh, drugstore or Amazon uh, or, or, you know, internet uh, 
provider at Walmart, that sort of thing. Um, they do sell the radon gas test kits. Um, it's usually a couple of days where you have to leave them exposed, usually in a basement area, because that's often the, the part of the house that is most at risk for radon. Um, you can leave it out um, for a few days there, then package it up. There's usually somewhere you have to send it off to. It's usually included in the, the purchase price for the kit. And they can do the test and help determine if you do have a high level of radon exposure in your house or not. Um, if that test comes back as positive, then you might want to do further investigation and, and a much, um, it's kind of a rapid test is the one that's available at drugstores on Amazon and Walmart. Um, there is a more extensive test that you can get. If you have questions about that, I'm also happy to, to field some of those as well. Um, again, check the radon maps. And it, and it really is dependent on the local geography and geology of where you are. So that will be something to talk about a bit at the end if you're interested. Um, pollution levels, again, it's great to take a look at those. If it's a really bad pollution day, depending on the weather here in the, the metro area, you may want to avoid going out if you can. I know sometimes it's not possible, but might also want to try and lessen your risk as much as possible if you can with that. And if you are using chemicals around the house or if you're doing home renovations in particular, things like drywall, painting, things like that. You want to watch the ventilation. You may want to use a respirator or some other type of facial mask and protection that would uh, uh, help you be less exposed to those fumes if renovations are going on at your home in particular. Uh, in terms of improving the physical environment, um, if possible, fresh unpolluted air is great. So open those windows up when it's not raining out. And when it's nice weather, if there's a good breeze, that's always a good option. Some people have found that air purifiers can help in terms of their indoor air quality. And certainly with the pandemic, people are more, more aware of, of that. And I think there are more options available now. Um, and again, as I mentioned, radon testing and mitigation may be something you want to look into depending on where you live in LA. My first um, my first step would be to look at the map, see if you're in an area that might put you at risk, and then uh, take a look at some of the options for, for a household test. Um, in terms of the non-environmental side of things, uh, for some people, genetic testing may be an option. You may want to consider that. Um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to field those as well. It really will depend. I would take a look first at your family history, and if you have a lot of relatives, for example, who do have uh, you know, extensive cancer in your history, who had cancer, um, then take a look at your sort of lifestyle exposures and let that help sort of dictate the conversation. You might also want to discuss that with your primary care physician as well. So that would be another person you can, you can speak to about whether genetic testing would be, would be um, suitable for you if you feel comfortable doing that. That's, that's also an option. And more generally for, for cancer and lifestyle, uh, improving nutrition, we know that uh, it's been in the news recently that colon cancer as well is, is a, a cancer that's rising, especially in younger people under 40. So that is an area that we, we can probably all have a little improvement on, improving nutrition, improving our exercise and our sleeping patterns. Currently, in, in terms of nutrition and health, the, the recommended diets are often the, the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, which is typically more for people who have uh, diabetes or cardiac risk factors. And there's also um, more colloquially known as the Blue Zones diet that was popular a few years ago as well. Not so much a diet, but more sort of types of foods that you would be eating. And again, those are typically lots of vegetables, lots of whole grain fibers, decreased animal proteins, a um, little bit of oil, decreased sugar, that sort of that sort of uh, recommendation is always good and healthy and limiting the processed foods uh, in particular for colon cancer. That scenario is getting more discussion and coverage lately in the media. In terms of exercise, um, you know, I would always say exercise to tolerance or a little bit beyond. You don't want to hurt yourself, but you do want to be moving. You do want to get some regular daily exercises is often the best way of doing it. You know, and anything from if you can put a little bit of a walk in your day at lunch if you can park the car further out, if you drive, put a little bit more walking that way, just keep yourself moving. Because when you keep your body moving, you keep everything, all of your systems flowing in good order. And I think that helps. 
And then for sleep, I know it's a lot. Some people are, are, are having lives right now where sleep is, is at a premium, but if you can get a minimum of seven hours, it is a really big restorative function for the body. We're just starting to learn about how sleep is important in terms of research and the data that's out there, but it's definitely playing a larger role than, than a lot of us would have liked to admit. And I've done those late nighters as well myself as, as a student and, and even at work sometimes. So it's, it's important though, to make sure you get rest and get sleep and try and be a nice balanced in your life if you can. Also in tied in with that is limiting stress. Um, it's been a lot, you could do a whole, we do a whole session on stress, of course, and stress reduction. And I know CSCLA has some great resources for that. Um, a few I'll mention here, some sort of spiritual or mindfulness or meditative practice. Um, you can even use the phones and have the smartphone apps. Some people find music is great for that. Um, joining a support group, positive social groups are also really helpful in reducing stress, can be volunteering classes, trying to find those positive social encounters. And, and in, a, in a world that seems to be often you know, heavy on the, the negative news, trying to put some positive in your daily life is really important, I think. I've mentioned again, screening for other cancers as well. Um, you know, mammograms are important for the ladies, colon for everyone, prostate for the gentlemen. Um, and you can just follow the, the general uh, guidelines and advice from your primary care physician or from you know, insurance groups like Medicare um, and other, other guidelines as well that are available nationally from some of the cancer societies. Those are also really good to look at. And again, genetic testing. Um, again, uh, I would always take a look at your family history, your personal exposure history, and then have that conversation with, with the healthcare provider. That's really the best way of approaching it. Now, if you do come in and get a lung CT scan with us, um, and we do happen to see something that might be a bit concerning for us, uh, what are some of the options? I'll go through these really briefly, and then uh, we'll have time for question and answer here in a few minutes. So options, if we find something on the scan, it may be that it's, it's a, a finding that just needs a little bit more investigation. Uh, as I said, um, you can develop nodules on their scan. They can be benign, they can be malignant. If they're benign, they could be from infection, inflammation, from exposures to, to non-smoking factors. So that might be, if they do start to look though a little bit concerning, our next step might be uh, to have another diagnostic test. It might be that we repeat a CT scan more uh, frequently sooner than the, than the year check-in, it might be three or six months down the road, or we might want to do a CT scan with contrast, which gives us then a, a more detailed view of some of those tissues and the area or areas that would be concerning us. Um, if it looks uh, like it might actually be perhaps malignant and cancerous, we might uh, have a different type of scan, which is called a PET scan. It's basically a big fancy CT scan that involves um, what's called a sugar test. So they, they do take um, uh, basically sugar water, it's injected into, it circulates through your system, doesn't cause any harm or anything like that. But uh, cancerous tumors really love sugar and they will gobble it up. Uh, there's a little bit of a radio opaque dye as well. So when, when that goes through your system, the cancer tumor, if there is one, will gobble up all of that substance and then as we put you through the scanner, it will actually show up much more brightly than the surrounding tissues. And if we do a scan like that, then it's, it, it is considered um, highly likely that that is, is a cancerous area that we need to then move on and look at doing some surgery for. Uh, for other types of nodules, we might just go, depending on the CT scan finding, we might just go straight to either a biopsy or surgery. And with biopsy, there's typically two types of biopsies we can do for, for uh, lung nodules, either using a, a percutaneous needle, so that's a needle that goes through the skin uh, under radiology. So you are in the CT scanner and they are using that to guide the needle. They will go in through your skin. They will target that particular nodule, that area, and they will be able to basically remove it using the needle. Uh, other than that, if it is something that's a bit more serious, larger, or the placement is more complicated, uh, we may need to do some OR and some surgery. There are two types of surgeries that we can do. We can go in thoroscopically, which is basically where we go in through um, a couple of tiny small holes, and we're able to remove the, the nodule or the area, the, the part of the lung tissue that's suspicious. 
Um, we can also do it with what's called the ION or the Da Vinci um, tools, which are actually done by putting a tube down your throat and we can then maneuver through the airways and the pathways in the lungs that way. So it actually, we don't need to actually go in through, through the skin through some smaller incisions like a more traditional um, surgery would be. Um, and if it is something that is a bit larger, we may need to go to the more traditional surgery where we're doing a, a larger incision and go in from the outside. Uh, but there are also, also non-surgical options what might be something to look at, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, I've mentioned those, immunotherapy and targeted therapies are newer therapies that are using particular medications to target and treat uh, tumors and, uh, and masses. So there's lots of options basically. And what we try and do is look at what your situation is and we try and tailor the response that's appropriate for you and, and your situation, what the findings are from the CT scan. So it's a conversation that is best held with our surgeons and with me, for example, and all of us would meet together with you and we'd uh, talk through what some of the options are. There often are a couple of approaches that we can take and it's about finding what works best for you. And so then if, I, if you do need uh, continuing treatment after that, so we talked about some of the surgical advances there and some of them are really fantastic um, so to see what they do in the OR versus even a couple of years ago, it's, it's really moving leaps and bounds every year. Um, there's also new chemotherapy regimens that have been developed and are currently being developed. Um, immunotherapy is new. Um, we can often link you in the clinical trials if that's something that would be uh, advantageous to you. Um, radiation therapy has changed quite a lot in the past few years. Um, they're using a lot less radiation. They're able to target sites better. So that's been some fantastic new outcomes for, for that type of therapy. And future directions that we might see. I um, know some of this is in the works and there's some current research going on. Liquid biopsies, as they're called, which is actually using a blood test to detect some cancers in the early stage. There's been some really interesting work being done on that. It's still a few years down the road. But it would not surprise me if in you know, a few years from now, if we were having this conversation, that would be something we'd also be doing to, to, as, a, as an early stage screening intervention. And there is also some work being done on developing a vaccine. Um, many of you may be familiar with the vaccine for cervical cancer, Gardasil. That's been uh, introduced, uh, especially to, to younger people, to teens, 20s, 30 year olds. I think you can get it from about your teens to about your early 40s. Um, is, is the recommended age for that. Um, and it's to target uh, cervical cancer human, human papillomavirus, that, which causes cervical cancer. And that's been a fantastic uh, advancement in, in trying to prevent that type of cancer over the past few years. And there are vaccines in cl clinical trials for certain types of lung cancer as well. So lots of advancements, lots of science going on, lots of exciting research. And again, to, to harken back to my first slide, it doesn't mean that cancer is a death sentence. It just means you have cancer and now let's, let's come up with a plan and try and, and deal with it as best as we can. So I think this is a great opportunity then to move to the question and answers. I, I hope this maybe has answered a few of them as we go along and I'm happy to either discuss them here or if you'd feel more comfortable reaching out to me in private, my contact information will be at the end. And I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation offline with you as well. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that informative and meaningful talk. We really appreciate you being here. And I invite all of you to type your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. We've already received a couple of questions, so I'll start with those. The first one is an individual who has had multiple exposures, including smoking, uh, radiation for breast cancer, um, secondhand smoke, a casual smoker, is it possible to determine the factors that actually cause one's cancer when you've had these multiple uh, risk factors? That's a really good question. Um, at this point, I would say it's, it's almost, I haven't seen studies yet that have been able to tease out if one particular factor is worse than the other. Um, and there's a lot of different variables at play. It can be the person's own genetics. Um, and, you know, we get cases where 
you know, people never smoked and never were around smoking and they developed lung cancer. We have cases where people were heavy duty, two pack a day smoker for 40 years and nothing showing up on their CT scan. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to be able to tease out if one particular area caused it or not. What I would say is from my own experience, both, both family members and, and working in cancer care, um, there, there's really not one thing in particular that would do it. There's, there's no kind of magic bullet that really, really causes it. Um, the more risk factors you have, generally the more at risk you are is probably a good way of explaining it. So, and, and risk is not necessarily linear, it's exponential but how that plays out is going to vary person to person. Um, and as I said, I haven't seen a study that's been able to, to pick out particular factors, but I think the more important message is if you have a lot of risk factors, definitely, you know, I'm happy to get in touch with you, talk with you. That's, I would definitely be having that conversation with either me or primary care physician about, should I be having more screening done based on all these risk factors? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. We also have a question related to breast cancer. You mentioned in your talk that those who've had radiation for breast cancer may be at risk for lung cancer. And could you talk a little more about that and how often one might have screenings? Okay, um, so this is an area where there's, there's, there's been some research done, but it needs further study. Um, and I, I think there are a couple of studies actually going on right now that are looking at exactly that. Um, so a couple of the ones I looked at uh, just the other day in preparing for this, um, this lecture, um, what they have found is that typically the, the highest risk in that situation would be if you're a woman who's had breast cancer, you've had radiation therapy and particularly older forms, which were much more higher dosage and much more extensive often in the breast. Um, if the type of breast cancer you've had was triple negative, which is already a very uh, aggressive form of breast cancer, and if you smoked, if, if that sounds like you, then I would definitely be having the conversation about getting some, some lung screening done, because that puts you in more of the highest risk category in terms of potentially developing uh, a lung cancer further down the road after you've, after you've successfully beat breast cancer. So that is something that I would definitely want to have a conversation with your primary care physician or with me on uh, regarding that. Um, generally speaking, um, it, if you've had, um, again, the, the older types of radiation did target a lot more of the breast in a much higher doses. So um, what often happens is um, it, it's not a high number that I've seen, but it is a small number and not insignificant. You know, one is too many really for me. Um, there are women who have developed lung cancer and, and to start develop questionable nodules that might be cancerous um, from, from the radiotherapy for, for breast cancer. Um, it's a small number. And again, as I said, if you have other risk factors that would put you in a higher risk category. Um, depending on the study, um, I've seen every anywhere from about one to 10 percent. Um, and the average being about 3% of, of um, when they looked, um, when they did retrospective studies and they looked at women who had lung cancer and then also had breast cancer um, and were treated, um, the average is coming about 3%. And that's just based on a couple of studies that I've looked at. Again, it needs much more, um, it needs much more um, research, to be honest, to find out exactly what, what is triggering it. Um, but again, any, any exposure to radiation, it, depending on the person, depending on their other risk factors, again, that can be an issue. So, so as I said at the beginning, if you had breast cancer, if it was the older forms of radiotherapy, um, if it was triple negative, um, and if you were a smoker, then definitely you would be in a higher risk category. So th that would be what I would suggest. I hope that answers the question a bit. Yeah, it's again that we're the, the link hasn't you know that there just isn't enough data at this point to you know unquestionably say that yes you should be getting lung screening done, but again a case by case basis look at your own individual risk and and I hopefully I, some of the risk factors I've, I've discussed here is a good starting point for that conversation with your with your physician or or with me you're welcome to give me a call too. Thank you for that. There's an additional question about having many small nodules that are being watched and uh, not treated. And 
talk a little bit about that and and why someone might not be in treatment but uh, be in an observation phase. Okay. Um, so for a lot of the nodules with the CT scans, um, they really are incredible tools. We can find nodules that are so tiny, they're basically the size of the tip of a pen. If you think about in your, if, if people still use pens to write, <laughs> you think about the tip of a pen, that's maybe about two millimeters or so. We can actually see nodules down to that level. Um, now, nodules can come from a number of different things. They, they can be from, you know, they can be from having smoked and they may or may not be cancerous. They can be from infection. If you had, you know, a bad chest infection when you were a kid, um, we don't know about COVID yet, but that definitely is, it is a, a chest infection. So it could be something that is still coming. The, the, the statistics, the data is not in yet on that. So COVID could be, could be a potential risk factor for developing nodules. Doesn't mean they'll turn cancerous, just means that they're nodules. And again, they're, they're abnormal clumps of cells that just aren't the same as the other cell tissue around it. And so that's why they show up on the CT scan. So it could be from smoking. It could be, it could be from infection. It could be from inflammation as well, too, from, from exposure um, to different chemicals. Could be from, again, the, the, um, the infection um, that can often cause inflammation as well. And some people also just have misshapen cells, basically. Um, we often, when I talk about this with people in the clinic, you know, if, if you took a hundred people off the street, um, it could be as many as one third of them who have nodules in their lungs. They're very small. They're not causing them any harm. They're not cancerous. They're just there again from one of those other factors. And, you know, they would only know that they were there if they had a CT scan. And the x-rays um, don't actually get down to that fine level of detail. Um, on an x-ray, typically something in your chest needs to be uh, about, I think it's about three centimeters for it to actually show up, which is quite big. And then three centimeters, of course, is 30 millimeters. And so with our CT scans, we can actually, it, it's almost like zooming in by a power of 10. So we can see very, very tiny nodules that may be non-cancerous at all. And again, I showed you the shapes. We do look for certain sizes, shapes, appearances on the CT scan that start to look suspicious and that's what we want to investigate. So a lot of nodules, they, they can be there. It can be there for years. They're not cancerous. You just happen to have an odd clump of cells and they're, they're not going to turn cancerous. They're, they're okay to just be there. And, and if they're not causing you any harm, if they're not causing you any breathing difficulties or anything like that, it's, it's okay to have them. Yeah. We just want to watch them. And we rec that's why we recommend typically as, as a default, a, a yearly check, just the same as with the ladies and the mammograms. You know, we want to check the, the breast tissue, make sure that that's okay, that there's nothing going, um, going off, uh, no cells changing. It's the same thing with the lung nodules. They can be there from even an old inf infection when you were a child, and they'll just be there it's not causing you any harm. It's not going to change into cancer or anything like that. It's just, it's just an area of misshapen cells. Thank you. We have a question about the smoking cessation class on, sure. it's in June, I think yeah. you said. Yeah. Is that, is that class have any cost with it or is it a free class? It's a free class. Yep. It's free. Um, we're going to try and do it in four weeks. I know most classes are six, but I'm mindful that we have Memorial Day and uh, July 4th on either end of that. Um, so we're trying to see if we can do a little bit more of a uh, compressed class, but it would be all the content that I would do in a six week class. I'm going to try and squeeze it in. It's a good time of year. Hopefully the weather will be good. Um, it's, it's a free class. You're welcome to join either virtually or in-house. Uh, some people prefer coming to a class in person. Some their schedules won't allow it. So virtual is an option and yep, it's open to anybody you think might benefit. Um, certainly you've got the, the link there. Feel free to check out the website or you can give me a call if you want more information about what we'll cover. What we'll go through is um, very roughly, we'll go through some of the, the biology of smoking and quitting smoking. We'll talk about ticks and trips for quitting smoking. Um, I would ask that you are ready to quit and we'll have you quit during the program and that we will be able to give you a couple of weeks of check-in and coaching as you go through it. And hopefully that will set you up well then to carry on with, with staying quit, as I call it, uh, after the program, so yeah. And so to enroll, they would uh, go to the link 
Yep. And you can go to the link and just click on and fill in your information and sign up. Yep. Great. And if you're attending today and miss the link or not able to grab it from the chat, please email us at info at cancersupportla.org and we'll make sure that you're sent the link. And then one, one final question that we received at registration, and I think we'll we'll end with that because we're nearing the end of our time together. And that's a, a along the lines of education, a question about how can I better educate my family and my friends who might be at risk to get screened, recommendations for that? Um. Probably the best thing you can do um, in terms of links. I'm just thinking um, I may I may have to send you guys a, a couple of extra links. I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, the links that I have at the end of the slideshow here, um, Kick It California is one that's from the California State uh, Department of Health. They run a really great program, uh, lots of information online in English and Spanish. They also, if 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 you're uh, from the Asian American community, there's also several languages where they have um, uh, materials available as well. They're a really great resource. So the link is at the end of the uh, end of the presentation here. Not just for quitting smoking, but also information on um, on why it's good to quit smoking. Lots of information from that. So their website's really great um, in terms of. Um, Raising awareness, um, the American Lung Association has a lot of good um, materials as well. And I often um, refer people to that if they're looking for something to pass on to friends and family um, as well. Um, I'm just trying to think here off the top of my head. Um, the CDC is a little bit technical at times, but if you do have kind of, you know, science-y or medical or you know, techie people in the family, they might appreciate a little more, um, more information, more study, more research. So they're also really great as well. So those are probably the three websites that I would recommend for more information. Um, or you can also give me a touch and uh, we can maybe have a conversation if it's also more discussing this with, with friends and family, you know, I can, I can give you some ideas on how to approach the conversation there too. Great. And Sarah, I believe you had an additional slide to share with your contact oh, yeah. sure. just... information in case anybody attending would like to write that down right now. Sure. Can you see that okay there? Yes. Okay. Um, just move forward. So um, I'll just skip this. I'll come back in one second. So this is the uh, resources list here that I was talking about. So the information on radon the risk map, and then the EPA has some really great information about the radon uh, test kits, so I direct you to them as well. Some of the smoking cessation link here, again, that's the link for our course. The Kick It California, which also has the great information that you can pass on to friends and family, the American Lung Association. And um, before our, our June class starts, if, if you were in need of uh, Looking at smoking cessation uh, help, Nicotine Anonymous is, they do have weekly classes going on. I know not everybody likes their format. It is a 12 step format, but um, they do have classes both in person and virtual. If you were looking for a little bit of support group help in the meantime, our class again will start in June. And I'll just go back here. And that's my contact information there. Um, my direct line is the one ending 8686. You're happy to, I'm happy to have you give me a call and we can have a conversation, answer questions and, uh, and help uh, get you connected up with what you might need. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Sarah. Well, let's leave that slide up in case anyone is writing down your information. Perfect. And then I would like our attendees as well to know that we will have Sarah's slides to share with you. If you would like a copy of these slides, please email Cancer Support Community Los Angeles at info at cancersupportla.org. It's going in the chat right now, but again, it's info at cancersupportla.org. Sarah, I would like to thank you for your time today and for sharing your expertise with us. That was an incredible talk and we really appreciate your time today. I also wanna thank you, our attendees, for your engagement with us today and for your very thoughtful questions. If you want to learn more 
about cancer support community, as a reminder, you can visit our website at cancersupportla.org. Thank you to everyone for attending today, and we'll see you for the next event, and have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.